manual Louisa Dunkley oration and excitedly for me, the first one in person. <laughs> so we are so pleased to see so many smiling faces in the audience and such a great turnout on a Friday night um, when people could have gone to the pub. Um, <laughs> we are going to start tonight's proceedings because this could not happen without the support of Monash University with a short video from Professor Margaret Gardner. So, welcome, Professor Gardner. However, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second Louisa Dunkley oration. Before I begin, I wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands I'm located and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also want to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person present today. Given today's event, I would particularly like to acknowledge the achievements of Indigenous women their strength, their resilience, and the vast contributions they've made in shaping the cultures of this country. I'd like to send my warmest appreciation to this year's orator, Neodol Nyon, OAM, an Australian lawyer and human rights advocate whose work on legal reform, social justice, and multiculturalism undoubtedly <coughs> exemplifies the values of Louisa Dunkley. I'd also like to give my sincere thanks to Peter Murphy, Federal Member for Dunkley, for inviting Monash University to again host this very special occasion. The Louisa Dunkley Oration is, of course, named in honour of the late Louisa Dunkley, a union leader and proud feminist who spent many years of her life campaigning for equal rights for women. Today, her remarkable legacy and her name lives on. Louisa Dunkley fought for an important cause, and it's a cause that's strongly embedded in Monash's values and aspirations. A focus on gender equity and inclusivity has been fundamental to Monash University for more than three decades. Our ambition is enshrined in our strategic plan, Impact 2030, and supported by our respected Monash initiative and by our intersectional Gender Equality Action Plan. Central to our pursuit of excellence is working towards a more equitable, diverse and inclusive Monash. Indeed, we aspire to be recognised as a leader in gender equity. Last year, Monash was a finalist for the Gender Equality Award at the Australian Human Resources Institute. There is still much to do, however, particularly as we move towards a more intersectional approach in our understanding of gender equity. Looking to the legacy of Louisa Dunkley, we have a shared responsibility for addressing gender disparities, calling out inequalities, and challenging bias for all women, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, those from diverse backgrounds, sexualities or faiths, women with disabilities, and those who are underrepresented in many ways and in their fields. At Monash, we're proud of the increasing diversity of our staff profile. We can measure our progress in gender equity in many ways, from experiences of respectful culture and addressing unconscious bias, visibility of leadership commitment, as well as staff satisfaction with family-friendly policies. However, the cumulative impact of all interventions must also manifest in visible change. Our staff data tells us our work in gender equity is making a positive impact. In senior professional roles, we've been at gender parity for the past three years. Mentoring programs and initiatives such as the Senior Women's Shadowing Program play an important part in supporting the advancement and retention of women at Monash. In senior academic roles, however, we're making slower progress against systemic barriers. Currently, we have just 36% of women among the professoriate. Even though the majority of our senior executive and our governing body are women. As professionals, as educators, and as researchers, a considerable responsibility must fall to us 
in challenging the biases, the conditioning, the assumptions and the structural barriers that prevent achievement of gender equity and hamper embracing diversity. I trust you'll enjoy tonight's Louisa Dudley oration and I look forward to this event continuing to be a significant occasion for many years to come. Thank you.
We obviously can't have the Louisa Dunkley oration without Louisa Dunkley's story. And I know many of you, or most of you will have heard it before, but sit down, get comfortable, you're about to hear it again. Louisa Dunkley was a woman who didn't come from particular wealth or privilege. Her father died when she was relatively young and someone had to provide for her family, her mother, her two brothers and her sister. And that job fell to her. So in 1882, Louisa entered the Victorian Postmaster General's Department as a junior assistant. Over the next decade, she worked her way up to become a telegraphist at the Chief Telegraph Office. As her career progressed, so did her indignation at the unfair pay and conditions of her female colleagues. Louisa Dunkley was a worker. She was a feminist at the turn of the century. And in 1895, she became a trade unionist. The Victorian Telegraph Union of the mid 1980s wouldn't admit women as its members and it wouldn't advocate for their workplace rights. So Louisa said, well, she didn't say buggy wall, but I feel like that's what she might have said. <laughs> um, Louisa and her female colleagues took the cause into their own hands and they established the Victorian Women's Post and Telegraph Association. On behalf of that association, Louisa went before the then Victorian Colonial Public Service Classification Board, where she advocated for women at the Post and Telegraph Office to be paid the same as their male colleagues for doing the same work. Her advocacy was described in the Argus at the time as brilliant. She was an incredibly smart woman. And she won pay increases for the women. Meanwhile, the men whose union had refused to make submissions because they were worried that they didn't want to get the colonial government offside and who refused to represent women received pay cuts. <laughs> yeah, story's not over yet. Uh, it is fair to say, you might imagine, that not everyone was so pleased with the outcome as Louisa and her female colleagues. So in an attempt to isolate her from those um, colleagues and to stop her from being able to collectively campaign, the masters of the Post and Telegraph Office transferred her to a re more remote workplace. It didn't work. Uh, they didn't really think it through, did they? Because she worked at the Post and Telegraph Office, <laughs> where the means of communication were pretty readily available. Undaunted by, undaunted, un, there's a Freudian slip, undaunted by opposition from those who resisted change and those who protected power, Louisa continued her campaign, attracting like-minded men as well as women to her cause. In 1900, she gained endorsement at the first National Congress of Telegraph and Post Associations from across all of the colonies. You can imagine why they were all getting together in 1900 to argue for equal pay in the soon to be formed federal public service. She also played a really important role in uniting the colonial associations into what later became Australia's first national public service union under Louise's leadership. Two more years of letter writing, lobbying, pamphleteering and demonstrating activities that I'm very familiar with and I imagine a few people in this room are as well led to the inclusion of an equal pay provision in the Commonwealth Public Service Act of 1902. Almost single-handedly, because of Louise's drive and her ability to get people on her side, one of the first laws of the first federal government of Australia had an equal pay provision for men and women in the Commonwealth Post and Telegraph Office. It's a remarkable achievement at any time but imagine doing it at that time. So Louisa Dunkley is a woman who lived and fought for her values, for fairness, for equality, for the power of collective action to improve and strengthen community. We could all do much worse than follow in her footsteps. To promote Louisa's values, 
to keep her name and achievements alive, to inspire and to celebrate women and men who have made an outstanding contribution, our community, good old Frankston, thanks to the support of Monash University, hosts the annual Louisa Dunkley Oration. And that's how we get to be here tonight. Without further ado, and yes, I think that's, I think Louisa deserves a used to speaking with notes, but hypothetically my office wanted me to use notes so I didn't end up talking for 40 minutes. So. <laughs> uh, without further ado, uh, with great pleasure, I'm going to welcome Josh Berry, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Now, Josh is 17 years old and he's Mornington Peninsula Shire's 2023 Young Citizen of the Year. Josh launched his Two Pairs Each project seven years ago, so that would make him 10. With the aim of collecting 50,000 pairs of socks so that every one of the 23,000 homeless people in Victoria could each have two pairs. So far, Josh has given out more than 39,000 new pairs of socks, engaging donors and business partners. Josh educates members of the community on facts and issues surrounding homelessness, putting a human face on a growing social issue. He's also involved in a range of community activities, including the Junior Fire Brigade, Sail Ability, it's a hard one to say, which helps people living with disability learn to sail, and the Air Force Cadets. Uh, we have a future member of Australia's Air Force sitting before us today. Josh's leadership shows that one person, no matter how young, can impact many. So, welcome Josh. to deliver the 2023 Louisa Dunley Oration. Nardole became Director of Victoria University's Sir Zelman Cowan Centre in January 2022 after more than a decade in community development and advocacy. Her work focuses on the legal reform, social justice, human rights and multiculturalism. A refugee to Australia, Nardole went on to complete a Bachelor of Arts at Victoria University and Juris Doctor at University of Melbourne before spending six years in commercial law at Arnold Block Libert. She is a regular media commentator, having appeared on the ABC's The Drum and Q&A, has also written pub for publications like The Age, Guardian Australia and The Saturday Paper. Now, well, Excuse me. Nidal has won several prestigious awards, including the 2019 Victoria Premier's Award for Human, Community Harmony and 2019 Australia Financial Review Diversity and Inclusion Award, where she was named Australia's top 11 most in, influential women. In June 2022, Nidal received a Medal of Order of Australia for service to human rights and refugee women. Please welcome Nida Nguyen. Uh, talking. 
And it's always a good reminder, especially when my kids are around, that no matter how influential you are, you cannot convince them to eat their veggies when you need. <laughs> or get them to take a nap when you're desperate for a rest, so they can remind you very quickly your award means totally nothing. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much for, for that generous introduction. I, I would also like to start with acknowledgement of country um, and acknowledge um, the traditional traditional owners of the lands that you and I knew today. For thousands of years, the Bunurong people of the Kulin nations have practiced their traditions and raised family and work and cultivated part of this lands that we now refer to as Brownstone. I wish to pay my respect to their elders who continue to maintain connection to culture and history and to present emerging leaders who do their best to preserve that culture and way of life. Now to me, acknowledgement of country is truly a time to pause and reflect. By performing the act of acknowledgement, we are called to pause and reflect that acknowledgement of country. It's not a throwaway comment before we get to the real serious stuff. It is the serious stuff. Um, it should serve as a reminder that our ongoing business of nation building remain incomplete. That questions of justice, equality, and reconciliation remain unmet. And that perhaps there's something, or that we should care enough to do something about it. And I think the voice provides one of those opportunities for us to contemplate how we might be involved in a country that is truly reconciled with itself. Now, I'm not saying that it is in this room, but I'm quite aware that the sentiments about pausing and reflecting are ones that are not shared or shared to the same degree. Uh, there are those who complain that acknowledgement of country is unnecessary and maybe even hostile. And such reactions are, of course, not at all surprising. It is hard to face history. It is very hard to face history. Yet, I want to believe, I wish to believe, as one of my favorite writers says, that it should be possible to love your country and to love justice. Because whatever our difference is, whether in this room or elsewhere, caring about justice and equality is a matter of our common health. It is a matter of our common health as citizens in a social and political society, but also as human beings. And I think Louise Duckling, Louisa Duckling embodied this attitude when she expressed the fight for equality of pay for women as a matter encompassing a larger question of fairness. And I actually got this, I think, from your first speech, the quote itself. Um, though at first, she said, though at first we only asked for equal pay as an act of justice to those women who had been doing the same work as men, we now advocate it is the only solution as to how to keep up the value of the work and provide fair opportunity for employment for both women and men in the future. <coughs> I am so honored to be invited to deliver this oration celebrating her contribution to our common good because her effort to secure equal pay and status for women have left behind a fairer and just society than the one she inherited by chance of being born a woman and by history itself. Now I have to tell you something. I have met Louisa Dunkley before. No, 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 I did not time talk. <laughs> but I've met that tenacity, I've met that stubbornness, that impatience of justice, I've met the attitude that refused to despair, as if knowing, as Martin Luther King said, despair is, is a poor chisel to carve out tomorrow's justice. I've met these attitudes that she embodied in my mother, and I've benefited greatly as a result. As some of you might know, I was born and raised in refugee camps before resettling to Australia in 2005. And it was my mother, really, who got me involved. Many people tend to assume that everybody wants to come to Australia. Um, and I've always wondered whether my mother ever wanted to. Like many parents, um, in her situation, she came to this country for her children. She wanted us to have a better life, but at least a chance to try to make something of ourselves. Because no matter how bad her country was, she was so industrious enough to survive, she was smart enough to thrive. I had seen my mother creating magic from little in Carpenter refugee camp. She ran a small business 
kind of illegal, really. <laughs> when she made local alcohol. <laughs> in order to make sure that we had school fees. She negotiated for a land to build our home in a place that was denied for a long time to refugees. We never went a single day without food in Kafuna when I saw many, many struggles. I've always felt my mother would have stayed in Africa had it not been for us. I know this because she glows when she returns from a trip from there. She seems more alive, and that light somehow diminishes each day as she stays in Australia. In coming to Australia, my mother made a sacrifice necessitated by war, and even more so by the love of her children. And I cannot escape that I was a big reason for that sacrifice. As our own light grew weak, my light shone. We came to Australia as refugee from northern Kenya, where there was no refugee camp, where there was no running water, no electricity, where, I, where we could barely meet our survival needs. Uh, and by the time, um, uh, by now, because of my mother's choices, I've ended up finishing um, school, working, uh, having a career that would have been entirely unimaginable without her sacrifice. And what made that possible was really what was initially, to my mother, a trauma. My mother was forced to marry at the age of 17 or 16. She was a brilliant student, an absolutely brilliant student, and I know this because she had somehow kept her report cards all that time. And she had promised herself, as a result of her condition, or what she was put through, that she was never going to do the same thing Daughters. And this is a very radical thing because they pay a very large dowry to marry your daughters from where I come from. So there was an economic incentive for a widow to be able to force her daughters so she can survive. But my mother insisted, she insisted that we instead go to school. And I know that because one of the things she did was to buy me a bicycle and also that I don't have to walk an hour to school. And I remember thinking, this was probably food from the table that has now become the wheels that allows me to build a life. And before we came to Australia, I remember my mother praying each night, hoping that somehow God will finally get us out of that, um, that refugee camp. And I was very lucky that we and my, my family have made it here. Now, I don't think that there are necessarily clear parallels between someone like my mother and Louise, thankfully. Um, they are women from two different centuries, different cultures. But I think they are committed to something that it is so important for the rest of us. It is a commitment to the idea of justice and fairness, whether that is expressed in the form of my mother's personal love and dedication to her children, or in the form of Louisa's campaign for better treatment of women. Now, I also think that they both share an attitude of courage. It's never easy to stand up to things that have been held dearly by your society, to assumptions that have been taken for granted. It takes tremendous courage to be able to be the first to speak up and to be heard, because that in itself involves huge, huge risk. But what I wanted to explore a little bit before I finish speaking, and because I can also hear my kids, <laughs> um, is the question is, what does that mean for us today? Mrs. Dunkley was a woman of her time. My mother, to some degree, might be also a woman of her time. I know that because we disagree on many things. <laughs> but I think that the way they've carried themselves through their life poses the question that what does it mean for us to be there for others as women, as citizens, um, and as fellow human beings, I suppose. And as a result, especially in the context of International Women's Day, I want to talk about two points that I hope allow me to challenge you um, as audience um, here today. The first one I want to talk about is the question of managing diversity among women, and the second question is about the capacity of our women movement to inspire transformative change. Now, the challenge of managing diversity among women has always haunted, haunted the women movement since the start. In every women movement, it has always been clear that not all women share the same terms of oppression. 
that some women have always faced additional burden of race, of class, and other forms of marginalization. This would have been true given a really productive time. Of course, we can all ask what was it like in 18 something to be an indigenous woman? It would have been a completely different experience to her experience. Now, it's not necessarily to judge someone by the standard of our time. It is simply to ask ourselves, what questions should we be asking ourselves in our time? As early as 1851, for example, at a women's right conference, there was a woman called Sonja True. She was born into slavery. She asked the audience a simple question, aren't I a woman? Because she knew when they spoke of women's rights, she wasn't included. It had been brutally clarified and spelled out in her life that as an enslaved black woman, she wasn't a woman, or the kind of woman that enjoyed protection. Today, I think truth assertion and I a woman can be partially captured by the concept of intersectionality. And I wanted to speak about the concept of intersectionality today, both as a challenge as a, and an invitation. Intersectionality sounds like a complex concept, but in my view, it can be simplified into two points. First, as I mentioned, it acknowledges that even if we share a gender identity, it is not the same thing as sharing the same terms or the same levels of oppression. Second and more fundamentally, intersectionality is a question of accountability. It asks how will we, the women who have seen progress, who are asking for power, actually use that power. In the way we speak about gender equality, there's often an assumption that women will use power in a very particular way, in a way that is more equitable. But I think women are human beings, which means we are also capable of being oppressors as well. Toni Morrison, one of my favorite writers, summarized this tension that I think is alive today in all the conversations we have about women movement and women's rights. And I will quote what she said. You are, or we are, the women who will take place in the who will take our place in the world, where you can decide who shall flourish and who shall wither. You will make distinctions between the deserving poor and the undeserving poor, where you, where you yourself will determine which life is expendable and which is indispensable. And since you will have the power to do it, you might also be persuaded that you have the right to do it. Since you will have the power to do it, you might also be persuaded that you have the right to do it. And as educated women, the distinction between the two is first order business. Morrison, I think, is trying to call attention to an important issue of our time. That it is one thing to have power. It is one thing to campaign about women gaining power. And it's, as I say, completely another thing to use that power. She's trying to warn, if we're not careful, women gaining access to social, economic, and political power will not in itself uplift all women. And when a social movement, whatever its shape, leaves some behind, this brings, um, leaves some behind its struggle to be relevant. And I think that's why every International Women's Day, we have questions about the relevance of it. And I think those are questions that come both internally and externally internally from the different various group of women that don't see themselves represented um, in the conversations that we have, on the tables that we have, who don't see their need taken seriously. It comes from indigenous women who continuously ask us to pay attention to this country first origin of sin. Now, I don't necessarily want to be provocative at all. I wanted to be a little bit inspirational, but I thought I'll take this chance to be a bit courageous and point some things out that I think allow us to think about our role today. Perhaps not similarly, but in a different way um, to what might have been the case um, in the 1800s. The questions in the 1800s will be very different to the questions we have to ask ourselves today. And the questions that we have to ask out today are complex questions about identity and belonging and position. Women are no longer as discriminated as they were, but we still have a long way to go. The power that we've gained so far, we must look at that power and question whether or not it is serving all women equally. I think the comment before from the previous video was quite interesting. 
where she mentioned that despite the fact that majority of the leadership of the university was women, women were still underrepresented um, um, in, in key leadership positions. Now, I don't know necessarily what, are, what is the way forward in terms of what our women movement look like in the modern terms, but I want to take two suggestions that I think um, Morrison, Tony Morrison as well, suggested in our work. First, I think we should hear Morrison warning, and we must assume, like this one of the speakers also said, we must assume responsibility to shape our new women's rights movement that is self-aware about what our demands for freedom and equality means not only in relation to societal inequality between men and women, but also among us as women, and sometimes just between the two of us. Now, they are concerned that even to put that additional burden of responsibility on women who are already struggling in a society to gain their right is an unreasonable demand. And to some degree, I do not share um, that concern. But why should we not be our sisters' keepers as we move toward freedom, power, and equality? Why should we ask ourselves every time the power we gain, the room we walk in, who is missing in that room? Why should we not hold ourselves up to higher standard? As the writer Maria Popova says, whatever privilege that may come to us and Biden, be it by birth or by chance, we, might, we must then earn that and deserve it through the integrity of our action. So I hope like Louis Dunklin and people like my mother did in their time, that we will remember our duty to other women and keep it in mind as we participate in society and continue to fight for change. That we would approach this new movement, these concerns are modern concerns, with a desire to achieve equality by design and not by accident. And to return to Morrison's words, that we would not, in our own pursuit for personal gain and ambition, uh, diminish the safety of our fellow sisters. Because women's rights is not only an abstraction in the past or today, it's not just a cause, it is also a personal affair. Finally, I really think that we need to revisit our own, the, the, the initial radical impulse that started the international women's rights movement. If we are to maintain the capacity of these movements and these conversations to inspire change and even to build solidarity, we can never lose sight of that core impulse. Our claim is not just based on gender, just as I think Louisa Duncan shows by saying that it was also about the fairness of the workplace for men and for women. Our claim, as has always been for every movement, no matter whether they're representing minorities or not, it is to a fuller, a fuller access to the entire claim of human dignity. So the quest for gender equality, as we have seen in the past, and all other persons, including the voice, these are not charitable pursuits to aid different parts of our society. They are, in fact, an indication of the health of our society. And so hopefully if we embrace that and contribute to that and follow the example of those like Louis Dunklin and in my own experience, my own mother, we might succeed. We might succeed in providing the next generation a uh, human heritage that they can be proud of. Or at the very least, perhaps a legacy with fewer injustices that they inherit by chance or by history. Thank you.
Lisa Dunkley oration was given by Julia Gillard, it shouldn't have made you nervous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. 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 God only knows who we're going to get for the third one. <laughs> um, so we've had a few questions come through on the QR code. It's had somewhat of a dampening effect because people can't give speeches in a tall microphone, but possibly the intent. Um, have some water. I think this is mine. Um, that's yours now. <laughs> you should really have a comedy or two. Yeah. <laughs> the long and the short of it. <laughs> oh, okay, this is a very serious occasion. Um, Dan uh, has a question. So as someone who has come to Australia from elsewhere and who has worked so passionately um, with and for uh, other refugees, what does connection mean to you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, um, hmm. we started with the easy question. Well, so, so I, have, I have an answer for that and then I have a challenge for that. I think, um, uh, and then I have a response to connection if I don't forget the three bits. <laughs> I, I think that, um, first of all, I don't, know, don't even know if I say, I would say that I've necessarily worked that hard. I, I tend to look at my life as uh, a lot of luck, um, and I consider myself a people made person, so I'm, I'm kind of the contribution of a lot of generosity and kindness and love and sacrifice in terms of my, my, my mom. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I don't necessarily think that it's, uh, it's so much about the hard work as the, the hard work comes because you've had the luck to actually maybe survive a refugee camp and get resettled to Australia and all that thing. But I also think that, you know, I've always, people have said that, um, or the phrase I've heard is that you campaign for communities and refugees communities. And I always, and this is the challenge, I always say that um, I don't campaign for refugees and whatever communities. First of all, I do it because I am a citizen and I think that I have a voice and, uh, and, uh, and sometimes it's a voice that probably came off because I just got really mad in the media coverage. Uh, but, but the other thing is also is that I actually, I, my community knows what racism is. My community knows what suffering is. Most of the time when I'm speaking to other people, I'm doing it for the mainstream. We don't need to have this conversation internally. We know what it is like to, to do it. So if I'm campaigning for anybody, it's the rest of you. <laughs> yeah. so just, That's a good answer. Yeah, um, and I think connection. Uh, I think this, the, 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 it's been a very wonderful, uh, um, uh, messy, uh, confronting journey. You know, sometimes I go from feeling as though this is the only country that um, that I can be alive in a particular way to. I want to get out of here as soon as possible. Is that when you read Twitter mentions? Yeah, yeah, and Andrew Bolt and the rest. Yeah. Uh, uh, read Andrew Bolt. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that, you know, um, I came to this country uh, in, in 2005. This is the only country that I've ever had official citizenship of. So when I came, when I came to Australia, we were considered stateless because the country of my parent birth had been birth had been in conflict for so long that we were now considered a stateless people. So Australia is the only country that I've ever had official citizenship of. It's the only country that I've ever owned a passport. Um, and I remember landing one time at Melbourne Airport and giving my Australian passport to the uh, immigration officer, and she said, "Welcome home." Oh. And for the first time, I had a. a moment there where it felt like home. I was looking forward to going back to Melbourne, to taking those trams, to experiencing, you know, the Melbourne sun hit on your skin. Like it felt so much like home and I was happy to be home. But that impulse was quickly accompanied by a deep sense of shame. You know, this idea that I abandoned everything my family had worked for. When you're a refugee, you live in these places where you were told that it's temporary, you know. We're just here to survive. We'll go home one day. We'll go back to South Sudan. We'll build South Sudan. And I came from a very political family. So I came from, you know, I came from a family that had dedicated years and paid with life for the idea of an independent South Sudan. So to me, it almost felt like I was abandoning that 
that that um, that heritage and that understanding and that connection because this other connection was developing. Um, and so it was quite a moment to sit there between this joy and pain and this connection and disconnection. And, and, I'm, and I'm working my way through that, um, I think. Uh, I think this is a country that is capable of being loved despite its sometimes very hard edges. Because I think that's what most of life is. It's both the bad and the good, and the ugly, and the balance of that. And so, yes, I think I have a connection um, that I feel that I do have a connection um, to this country, that I love this country, that I've met wonderful people, that my children are born here. This is the only place they will know. But that's also sometimes accompanied by the fact that I don't know whether it would get scary enough one day for me and my kids to have to leave. And there are times where politically the, the conversation, the media coverage gets to that point. It gets to that point where you question whether you can claim your full citizenship or whether you'll always be a conditional citizen. I've done it a little bit back to France to acknowledge these um, wonderful women towards the end. Um, but I want to acknowledge some women in the audience um, today who are in the same field as me and, and the, the broader political space um, that Nerdol is in as well. Um, we have Pauline Richards and Sonia Kilkenny who are state members of parliament and um, Sonia's a cabinet minister. Um, and we have... Um, Claire Harvey and Sue Baker and um, Despi O'Connor, who are councillors at Frankston and Mornington Peninsula Shire Council. Um, and I want to acknowledge them because it's not easy, as Nodo says, to put your hand up and put your head up above the fray. Um, and we should acknowledge when um, women do that. So thank you for being here tonight. We also have the Mayor of Frankston, who is a terrific ally um, for women. Um, and he's only here because I gave him his citizenship. So thanks for coming. <laughs> All right. Um, Claire has two questions, and I'm pretty sure the answer to the first one is your mother. Tell us about someone who inspired you as a young person. Were you listening, Claire? No. Um, she wrote that. She wrote that before Nantos spoke. I'm sure. Uh, if you could give your teenage self advice. What would it be? Uh, <coughs> hold on to your stubborn gut. You know, I think that um, uh, I've always allowed kid. Mm -hmm. um, I was quiet. Not, not surprising. <laughs> um, and I question things a lot, and I think that that was never necessarily welcome, especially as a woman. In fact, one of the things I used to be told. Um, we said, who is going to marry you? Um, <laughs> which, was, which is the biggest threat you can get, sort of, in my culture. So who is going to marry you? And, I mean, I completely went and failed in that, but that's another story. But it was... It was, it was <laughs> um, but I think that, I, 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 for a long time, I think I always questioned that. I wanted to become some, you know, try to be maybe a bit more quieter, and maybe, you know, it didn't last long. But, but I tried, and I think what I would tell my 10 year old self is, is hang on to that stubbornness. It's trying to tell you something. It's trying to insist that there's a different way of seeing this, um, and that you will figure it out, um, and that if you fail, you will be okay. Thank you. Mine is just hang in there, you will meet your people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, just, just don't try to be someone that you're not. Yeah because the people around you aren't your people yet, because one day you'll find them. And then they'll vote for you. <laughs> Darren has a question. Um, 
And I would like to know the answer to this so I can copy you. How do you balance your advocacy work with self-care? How do you cope with burnout and the emotional distress of your work, some of which we've just heard about, the personal attacks um, against you? No. Uh, not very well, but I've learned the hard way to um, to revisit that. Um, so initially, I just I kind of almost thought that I just could do it. You know, you just get up and you do it. And my jury were really sustained by just being really angry by by <laughs> by it. You know, it would, to, to turn up on TV and all they're talking about is you know African gangs. I mean, think it's just. I know all these women that are, you know, going to Alice Spring and working two jobs, and it's something that just piss you off enough to keep you going. Um, but I think that um, I've come to realize that we are all human beings, and none of us is invisible. Um, and so I became really, really bad, completely burned burn out, um, and just lost all kind of sense of joy. Like I, I, it was just emotions. I felt I'd lost. A sense of joy, maybe a sense of just deep hope. It was just routine, um, and COVID was really good for me. Um, I mean, no, yeah, because <laughs> um, everything slowed down, and for the first time, I was left with myself. And one of the things I did earlier on during the COVID break was to say, I'm going to, in addition to everybody working from home, I'm going to take time off work, and I took a month off work. I didn't know how I was going to pay the bills, uh, but I'm a risk taker. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I just every morning I will take my kids to care and I will walk for an hour or two, and I call them purposeless walk because I realized that even going to the park was just instrumental. I was just there to get the exercise done. I wasn't there to experience the sun or the leaves or whatever. And so everything in my life began to feel as if I was just using it to get to an end. And by forcing myself to slow down that much, I remember the first time sitting um, in Lindbrook and looking across this uh, little pond, and for the first time noticing the the the, the sun rays on the um, on uh, on the water, and, and I remember thinking, oh my God, I've become a hippie. <laughs> Introduction to the fact that I think we are all ex well not all that I am extroverted as, I'm, as well as I'm, I am introverted and it was sort of being introduced to that part of me that enjoyed the quiet and away from everything and and the books and so I think that was the beginning of realizing what self care looked like for me it was just to stop and I stopped and I now I try to actively um, create spaces in my life where I can. Um, I can have that rest, intentional rest, where I can do less, where I can just go for a hike, um, and then I, you know, and then of course I forget and I get into another routine again, and you get, you know, you get close to being burned out. So I think it's just a constant reminder um, of just understanding that our body are limited, um, and that, and that this is really the only body that takes us through life, you know, and sometimes it deserves more than just achievement. It also deserves care and attention. Um, it's not just a means to an end, it is in itself a thing. <laughs> and I think I've learned more and more to sort of do that. And I have to say that to me genuinely feel like a tremendous privilege um, because I don't think that people like my mother would have ever had the chance to do that because for them it had always been survival. And because I've, I've stayed long enough in a safe country where I had food in the fridge, I think I was able to maybe subconsciously relax enough to think, I don't have to survive all the time. I can think about thriving, I can think about resting. And I now take that as genuinely um, a privilege that I've tried to constantly remind myself to, um, yeah, to exercise. Oh, God, that sounds like a hippie, but there goes. You are very happy. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, um, it pains me to say, um, that we have actually gone a little bit over time and I have to end this fascinating um, evening. Needle, I think if Louisa Dunkley somehow was able to have seen tonight and to have listened um, to what you have said, I think she would be challenged and inspired and incredibly proud that you are part of the Australian story. And I can't 
imagine that anyone here would say anything else other than we are so grateful that you've spent tonight with us. Thank you very much.